But yeah, I do have a story. But but I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> Unless you've got a million dollars, in which case, let's have lunch. <laughs>
And uh, I didn't know any, my family, of course, all blue collar. We had nothing to do with Hollywood or entertainment at all. And so I didn't know what it was. All I knew was that whatever that was, I wanted to be a part of it. And, uh, and so after that, it was just kind of learning. It's like, what is that? What are movies and how do you do that? And what do I do in it? And um, so that was always just the, my driving motivation was to tell stories and make movies. And, uh, and then my mother remarried. We moved all around the U.S. and ended up in, in Utah when I was 14. And that was also one of those, those we, we arrived in a May, it was May... 1979, I believe. Got here in the middle of the night. In uh, we had a, a house out in Sandy, and in the late 70s, Sandy is very different than it is now. But our I remember we pulled in. You know, it's probably one o'clock in the morning, and I go to the bedroom and open the window, and there's this this aroma of uh, I did, I, learned, I didn't know what it was, but it's this incredibly sweet strong smell of these Russian olive trees that were in our backyard. And we had a little irrigation ditch, so there was the bubbling water and the smell of these Russian olive trees. And, uh, and the dry climate, I was used to, you know, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Kentucky, Mississippi, just humidity, it was awful. I hated it, you know. And I always had hay fever. Suddenly we get to Utah, and it's, it, to me it was, paradise and the beautiful mountains and I just fell in love with with it here and so I went to high school here and college and then went to Los Angeles for for 10 years to uh, try to figure out how to make this movie thing happen and uh, but I always always wanted to come back and so Utah is my home it's my adopted home I wasn't born here but I I absolutely love it. When I hear people complain about Utah, which they do frequently, I just think, you people are crazy because this is, this is, I've been all over the world and this is one of the most beautiful places and uh, wonderful places to live. Do I believe in God? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've tried, I've tried to not believe in God, and I can't. So now I don't have anything definitive to say about God. I certainly don't know who, what, he, she, it is, wants. Um, but I, yeah, I, I found that uh, a f faith is a, it must be a gift because uh, it's just something I, I have, even though I sometimes haven't wanted it and have doubted it. But but no, I, I absolutely believe in God. Um, but I don't. But as as a being created by this this God, whatever it is, you know, I do not have the arrogance to think that I could understand God. And, or the arrogance to tell other people what God is. You know, it's like that, you know. But, but I, you know, I, I don't believe, this is kind of one of my key things. It's like I don't believe a created being has the capacity to explain its creator. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense to me. So, uh, so I do. I, I believe I see God. I feel God. I feel a source of life, of uh, a creative. But to me, the, you ask me these questions, I could talk for <laughs> eight hours. Um, to me, God, uh, th it's hard to talk about because, you know, somebody asks you, do you believe in God? I say yes, and immediately the communication in a way is, it, it's almost, they immediately see in their mind what they define as God. Which, so the communication's faulty because it's like, yes, I believe in God, but what God is for me is not what you think it is. And so... Um, but people are just like, okay, now they can put you in a box. It's like, okay, no, you, you believe in God. Okay, you're in that box. And that's not, that's not it. Uh, to me, one of the most perplexing things about, about God is that uh, people think of God as being, you know, this uh, of just warmth and light and, and, and creation and all that uh, life. 
but I, I can't, I see God in, in the death and the tragedy, and all of that. There was, a, I remember in the tsunami some years ago, um, it struck me, I, I, I was a, I was a church going man at that point, and you know, in the, at the Sunday after the tsunami when all the stories were coming out, they were talking about the, you know, all the death and so many people had died. And, but, and I remember distinctly one person talking about a story of how the rescue workers were going along and, and they found a little toddler who had survived, somehow had survived, was on a, was on a, a, a door, a wooden door that was floating so they were and talking about how God had saved this child. And something clicked in me with that story. And it was like, yeah, God, that was God. But God was also what took how many other toddlers, how many other innocent people. That, you know, that the death, the darkness, that's all part of God too. Um, it's not just creation, but it's destruction. And it gives me more of a... Um, and awe for, for the God that I believe in and an acknowledgement that it's not just, you know, smiling Jesus with a kid on, its, on his lap. It's, it's everything. God is everything. So obviously I believe in God because God is everything. Well, my, my first experience of Los Angeles was of uh, getting there, of course, as soon as I graduated from college here in Utah, I immediately, uh, my wife and I, we just packed up our little, uh, little tiny Honda car or whatever, Dodge, I can't remember what it was, Dodge, Plymouth Horizon, that's what it was. Not a big car, but everything we owned could fit in this car, including our cat. And so we go to Los Angeles and, uh, you know, and I'm all excited. I've never been to Hollywood before. So I go right down to, you know, we get there, get settled, immediately go down to Hollywood Boulevard. You got to go to the Grauman's Chinese Theater, Hollywood and Vine. And I remember how underwhelmed and un unimpressed I was. It was like, it's, it was dirty. It was small. And Grauman's Chinese Theater was just concrete, dressed up concrete. And, uh, yeah, and I was just kind of like, really? This is this is it? This is... Um... And after that, w we had some great... I mean, they were happy years for me, my family. You know, we started our family, had our children, and but, but Hollywood itself... <laughs> uh, yeah, Hollywood's kind of a... Los Angeles itself is kind of a mag... It's kind of a... How do I say this without using profanity? It's kind of a... It's... It's kind of a magnet for uh, basically um, very. It's kind of a narciss a, a narcissism magnet, or it draws people who who are very sh you know shallow and people who are only in the business for uh, you know for for uh, fame, money, sex, ego, power, and those are the things I didn't. That's not why I got into the business. I got into it because I love storytelling. I love the craft. I love the art. And I found that in the actual business, there's very few people that, that uh, share that. Most people, uh, most people aren't serving the art form or the craft. Most people are trying to use the art form or the craft to serve themselves, if that makes any sense. It's like they're trying to use it to build their own egos, to build their own bank accounts, to build whatever, to get, you know, sex with models and fancy cars and fame. Um, and that's, that's just not it. So that's what is the, uh, what I came away from Los Angeles with. You go to parties and, you know, you don't meet. It's, it's some, at least it's hard to get outside the Hollywood circle because everybody's trying to get in. And so, and everyone's trying to use each other to get farther along, to get higher up. So you go to parties and immediately it's like, Oh, hi, nice to meet you. What do you do? Or who do you know? And, and everybody's always talking about, oh, I just had a meeting with this agent. I just had a meeting with this producer. Next week I'm going to meet. It's just constant bullshit. And, um, and so shallow, you know. And if you don't answer those questions correctly, 
if you don't if you don't have a meeting with you know a big CAA agent next week, or you know you don't know anybody important, then people just move on. You know you're not you're not worth having a relationship with. So we'll just move on. And uh, I got really tired of that, and and I know my wife did too. And and so one of the things we appreciated about coming back to the real world, um, coming back to Utah was, you know, our, our, sh our show business circle is very small. My, my show business circle now is very small. Obviously, I still have friends who are producers, writers in, in the business, but most of the people I know aren't. They're regular people. They're school teachers and they're cops or they're whatever. And uh, makes conversations and parties a lot more enjoyable. <laughs> It's kind of I have a I have a strange faith that it's going to work out. So even when it's as difficult as it can be, and even when it all falls apart, and when everything falls apart, I still have a faith that that uh, and not just a faith, but I think it's got to work out because what if I mean giving up is not an option ever because what what are the what are the what are the stories that I wouldn't tell if I gave up? Stories I haven't even thought of yet. You know, stories that will, you know, that would help people. And and uh, I'm a father. I have seven children, and I, and a lot of what I think about is is what I want. Not my children to see. Not not what they hear from me. Not, but. And I don't even know if they would ever be able to, if they would ever verbalize this, but I think maybe at the end of it all, to be able to know that, that, uh, that yeah, giving up's not an option. It, it isn't. I mean, I think of the guy, the guy that in college who gave up because his fiance didn't want him, didn't want the sacrifice. I don't know where he is now. But I know he didn't do what he wanted to do. I know he didn't do, he didn't make the films that were in him. And that's actually a loss to the world. I mean, in my, in my esteem, think of the, I mean, we, we see these great novels, these great films, uh, uh, Apocalypse Now, uh, Citizen Kane, or, or Les Miserables, the novel. I mean, what if Victor Hugo had just decided, no, nah, I'm not going to write. I'm not going to write. I'm going to go work as a clerk and, you know, in this store or in the government just to, it's safe, you know. And I'm not going to have to go through the ups and the downs. I mean, think of what the world wouldn't have because of that. And I don't equate my work at all with that. I hope someday to be able to, to I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? To, to be able to produce a work that would have that kind of an impact on, on humanity, on, on the human culture, the race, race and culture. And uh, so, I, yeah, there's no, there's no giving up. You know, there's, I mean, it, it would, to me, it would, that would be the death. As hard as it is to go through periods where you have no money, where you have no prospect for money, where you have no job, where you have, where people, you know, where you've lost all, all your friends, all your support, everything. You've lost your investors, you've lost your reputation. You've lost, that's awful. I mean, that's awful. But worse than that would be giving up and sitting in a, Sitting out in an office, you know, selling insurance, and there's nothing wrong with selling insurance. But if you're an insurance man who could be Victor Hugo, but you're settling to be an insurance man, well, that's that's sad not only for you, but it's sad for the rest of us, you know. And so, one one thing more that I'm just really conscious of, I'm only 54 years old. Probably to a younger person, it's like only 54. But I'm not 94, you know. But I am aware of the fact that this 54 years has gone by pretty quickly, and it's highly unlikely that another 54 is going to pass for me. It'd be 108. It's not too likely. And I think there is a perspective that comes as you, you know, as uh, you know, as you're a kid, a year takes forever. When you're an older, when you're older, it goes by like that, and you realize how fast they're going to go. They're going to go. And uh, so how how we spend our time and what we spend it on is, is becomes more and more 
and more important. And, uh, and to me, one of the things I've loved about making films is I've been able to use it as a way to uh, explore life for me. It was like to explore, to find out, is there a God and what is God and what is my relationship with God and what's my relationship to these other people? And without film, without film, um, I wouldn't be where I am in my, in my own personal development. I can't imagine not having, you know, I was able to use my, the filmmaking and my spiritual development and my, oh, everything, you know, it, it all became intertwined. And to take that out, um, it would have lessened my, the quality of my life. And uh, so uh, I want to, you know, I couldn't give it up because to me it would be like giving up food because I need it now, you know, it's like I need that. And, and even though sometimes the food's not very fancy, I'll take what I can get because I know, you know, it'll come along again. <laughs>